So uh, Mike Lau of Mike Lau Racing Engines asked uh, if you'd explain the differences in lobe design uh, for solid roller versus hydraulic camshafts. Well, you know, if you go back 30 years, there's a tremendous difference because the hydraulics, we thought that hydraulics were almost infinitely stiff. And we knew we wanted these big lash ramps because people like to run 36,000 slash, you know. So, I mean, you didn't have, you'd need a feeler gauge. You could take pocket change and run <laughs> a tip in the rocker arm for clearance. So these camshafts would have 50 degree lash ramps on both sides of it as it gradually took, a, oh yeah. And I mean, you know, and however much lash ramp you put in it, you'd have guys like John Lingenfelter um, who would run more. Like you design one for 30 and run 50 on it. And I remember as we started to get in the tight lash world, my good friend Gordon Holloway is the best, best cam salesman there's ever been. So Gordon comes in my office and he goes, hey, John wants to know how much lash to run on that new design that you had. He's got it on the dyno now. I said, well, Gordon, he needs to run negative 15. <laughs> he goes, negative 15? How in the heck do you say negative? How do you do negative 15? What's that even mean? I said, Gordon, I don't know, but every number I tell you, you add 30 to it. So I figured if I wanted you to run 15, I'd tell you negative 15, and at least you'd start <laughs> tight. You know, instead of, yeah. um, so I guess I say that by saying, if you go back 30 years, there's a huge difference. But what we've learned today is that the hydraulics have, because of the small air bubbles, the aeration in the oil in the high pressure chamber, and the valving kind of opening and closing to fill that chamber and everything, that there's a little bit of cush in that piston inside that hydraulic lifter. So as soon as you push on the lifter, that little piston in there, that seat, it moves a little bit. It sets down a little bit. And most people would say that movement's about four to 6,000 slash effective. Then you have the bearing in the rocker arm and the seat and everything. And that all compresses a little bit. So even a, a tight la a hydraulic really acts like it's got 12 thousandths or so lash in it. So you start looking at some of the newer tight lash designs in the you know, solid oars designed around 16 lash. And you look at these hydraulics that you know they're kind of smushy and they're designed for like 12 lash. There's some new loads that really blur the line between what's a hydraulic design, what's a solid design. They've totally, as tight lashes come in, as we start to understand hydraulics more and more, the differences have, there's still a difference. There's still, you know, a hydraulic still designed for like four to 12,000 slash, and a solid is still designed for like 12 to 24 lash, but they're coming together more. Now it's more about lift and RPM range. You know, there's not many one inch hydraulic rollers that go 10,000 RPM. So, you know, that the, the lift and RPM change things more than the even the lifter at this point, or as much. That's, right. And so he, uh, he laughed when he asked this to, when he told me to ask you this and he said, uh, he said valve springs now versus valve uh -huh. springs 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to understand there was a few like the the Vasco jet or whatever they were, the H11 tool steel springs. And I mean, these things, they would break. There was a few big, big wire race springs out there, but they were triple springs. And they, you know, the box of them said must team lift. They're super heavy, super big. The wires cruddy. They break like you, if you even look at them funny. And then today, the wire is a super clean material that people couldn't have even thought about, you know, 20 years ago. And so, I mean, you have to understand there was one year, if, people, if your listeners will look up the Kobe earthquake, there was an earthquake in Kobe, Japan. And this earthquake stopped the production of the spring wire we used for our 927, 943 springs back in the, back in the late nineties. And um, it almost shut NASCAR down. Because there's no other place other than Kobe, Japan, that made this grade of wire, and every valve train was built around this grade of wire. You know, so oh man, so yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. You know, like, yeah, he deserved to laugh on that. Yes, the springs. Then we were, you know, we would just get our hands on like some guy rummaging through the junkyard trying to put something together. We would grab hold of anything that we get got that almost worked. And today we're going in and we're special ordering the wire, the pitch profile, 
the loads, the processing, everything about the bow spring. And, and they're just so, today you see springs that are, you know, I, back in the early, back when DEI was running, running in Cup, you know, the DEI engines before they merged with ECR, um, Earnhardt Childress Racing. Um, before that merger happened, DEI had a spring that was about 140 pounds on the seat that would run over 10,000 RPM. You know, wow. real light, really, really cool parts and everything like that. So, yeah, you can get by with a whole lot. You're seeing that throughout motorsports, that lighter springs, lighter valve train, much better wire. Everything is just grown in leaps and bounds. And what's funny is some of those old springs, people still love them, but man, there's, there's just so much better today than those big, heavy, you know, uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right.